So I check into Bud's, uh, gosh, it was like early April. God, what year was that when you were in? You were probably just through Hell Week. I got 94? to Bud's in 93 and went no, to Hell Week in 94. 94. So yeah, April 94, whatever the fucking date was, uh, check into Bud's. And the first, so you, you check in as a, as a, just a dumbass. In the check-in process, you kind of package and you're all, oh my gosh, what am I going to go through? And nobody's hammering you yet. Right, right. And you have to go to medical, which is maybe 100, maybe 100 feet across the compound. You go to medical and I'm just sitting there in uniform. And you're in a Navy uniform and then the trainees are in whatever kit that they're in. And I see class 193 with their red helmets. I think they were blue at that time. They are blue, probably, yeah. Blue helmets, and there was only like six or seven of them. I'm like, okay, I wonder if that's the whole class. And then class 194, which is what Dan was in, there was probably post hell week 30 or so. 30 at that time, yeah, I think so. And uh, I'm like, okay, so there's an attrition. And you hear about the attrition, but you don't realize it until you're there going, oh my God. But now there's a, like 112 of us that haven't classed up. Right. Big numbers, and then there's six. I'm like, oh my God, it's legit. And he was, you were, sh you reminded me, it's just somebody short. Were you the, like the shortest guy in the class? I was a smurf for that, yeah. And I was like, okay, so there's this going on, and you're seeing the whole class play out, and nobody looks like what you think a seal is going to look right. like. And no, no Charlie Sheen's there and all this, because that's the only thing that you knew before there was, a, there was no internet. There's, like, there was no cell phone or anything at the point, that point in time. And uh, so 193 is going to go do something, and then 194 is about ready to go in and get a, an ass beat session in the compound. And you're kind of looking in there, and you guys were getting, this was probably a week and a half after. So after Hydro Week, mm -hmm. which we didn't know about, and then you're doing your first PT. And I was like, oh my God. And it was brutal from our vantage point, sure. from you know, not even classed up. I'm like, what is going on here? And I'm s still sitting at medical. You do a whole PT. Still, you're getting processed through so slowly. You're like, this is ridiculous. And the, you guys get down with your PT, and you come into the into the what's called the pit. And you come in there fucking pissed off at something, throwing your hat. And, and all the people that have classed up are kind of like, what the fuck's going on? And you come in throwing things around and yelling at something. And I'm like, this is an interesting group of guys. And, uh, and I don't think we ever actually met other than just students during Buds. We kind of did. That? I mean, yeah, I mean, every now and then and we talked. I know, I, know I know we talked a couple of times, you know. Yeah, and it, it was just funny. <laughs> but yeah, we, senior class guys don't talk to junior class guys. Oh, yeah, no. Uh, yeah. 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 Until you get a brown shirt. So you're a Until white you get a brown shirt. shirt. Yeah, once you're a brown shirt, then we're cool. But. So that means you made it through Hell, Hell Week. week. So you're white shirt until post Hell Week, and they, like, right when you get through Hell Week on Friday, they bring you your brown shirt, like it's a big deal. And I think it, I was the last class to get a green shirt. So we oh, you from, guys had the green, green shirt. shirt. And so we always wore green shirts, and then the Army basically came and flexed their muscles and says, you're part of SOCOM, so you, we had to switch our shirts to brown. So I think I was one of the last classes to get a, I think I was the last class to get a green shirt, because wow. my class, we had to switch to brown shirts. So when Tommy got done with his Hell Week, he got a brown shirt, yeah. But it's a big deal. No, it's a, like, big, it's a big, big fucking deal. Yeah. Yeah. So was this your fifth time? No, this is my first. It's the first time. And I, uh, I had gotten rolled out of that for, I got a concussion to Rock Portage on first night. <laughs> like, you know, whatever. Boom, woke up at the hospital. It fucking rocks, man. And it's, it's, so that whole evolution is designed to uh, see who's lucky. Do you remember reading all that stuff from past, uh, uh, like even back to Draper Kaufman that was in the first phase office, all those... Uh, books that he had, or notes that he had written. Mm -mm. Was that in the office? Mm -mm. God, it was weird. I did everything I could to not go in that office. <laughs> yeah, you were, uh, you, you were advanced training instructor, mm -hmm. but he was an instructor off cycle. So back to the thing. So we we're, we we're off cycle. So I, I do all my five classes and he graduates into the team. So we're separated by like two years in cycle. So it's a two year cycle. And then he ended up at SEAL Team 7 before I got there. So you were an instructor for a while, then he goes to SEAL Team 7, then I go to instructor, and then I ended up at SEAL Team 7. And he, you were a 
what they call a plank owner, which is when you stand up a team. Do you have? Did you actually get a wooden plank from it? Certificate? No. We were all supposed to get planks. We never got. I mean, they, maybe they got them. I, I never got one. I got a certificate that says plank owner. So I'm like, oh, okay. Which so. means like the oh the old wooden <coughs> ships that they get the they were the first people to gotcha. be a part of seven. So he was the one of the first crew at Team Seven. And then I came in two years after that, and he'd done two deployments at seven, and uh, so I was off cycle from him. And listened to our conversation last night, which should have been taped, but it was interesting to know. I was like, God, he was always right ahead of me in, right. in, the, in that deployment cycle. And how each deployment was uniquely different than the, the first time you deploy, there's no rules. It's the best time to go on a deployment to an area before it gets corporate. You know what I'm saying? Right, right, right. Yeah. It's very corporate. So, yeah. so you went to, where was your the point that you were talking about last night? Uh, the first one I went to Baghdad. And so I was in Baghdad and then the second one was to Mosul. To Mosul, which was a whole different wild, wild freaking west deployment. Where is that? Northern, northern Iraq. Gotcha. So make, huge city, northern Iraq. So Baghdad's the biggest, Mosul's the second biggest. It's where Uday and Kusay were. Yeah. And before we got there, that was the only special operations that had been going on there was, they went up there, they got Uday and Kusay, and then nobody had been working. And largely everybody thought, Mosul was a pacified city, so it just wasn't reports coming out. Well, when we got there, we figured out that uh, the army had basically was, the sheikhs would come in and they'd get paid off to not do anything. Well, when big army left, striker brigade, and we came in, the sheikhs all showed up to get paid. Well, we didn't have those coffers. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and next you know, we started getting fucking mortared and rocketed. And, and the first time in Baghdad, like when we would leave the compound, the seas would part, the population knew hey, those vehicles look different, those guys look different, get out of their way. Right. Well, Mosul, they had never seen us before. And we probably didn't make it a mile, we'd smashed like 10 cars, you know, and, and it took us a while, it took us about a month to educate the population as to, <laughs> we're coming through, we are not the army. And um, smash means smash. Yeah, we, we, you, we put, like, you, you're you getting know. out of our way. This convoy is not stopping. We're going over <laughs> curbs, sidewalks. We're going over you. It, our convoy does not stop for anything. No, because if you stop, you're a sitting duck. We're a sitting duck, right? right? And if, if the vehicle starts slowing down, we deploy and we're walking, right? Right. And so we got to Mosul and the impression, we were actually very upset to go to Mosul because my lieutenant was uh, big into recon. He wanted to go recon. So we, we thought right. we were going to Mosul to do these long range recons up on the border to watch guys come across the border. And when we got there, basically the FBI showed up and they were like, we have all kinds of targets. We've been waiting on you. And we're like, all right. And we started hitting targets immediately. And for almost five months, we were hitting an average of four to eight targets a day. And we would have designated stand. We were so busy. We would have designated stand down days. You know, our, our, our troop commander, uh, Commander Bazelli, who was just an awesome guy, was like, we're not working today. We're just done. And we were just like, you know. I bet that was exhausting. It was everything, you know, in the SEAL teams, you always dream of missions. Right, right. Like, oh, yeah, yeah. In Baghdad, we did missions. We probably did one every four or five days. And right. they're, they're, they're exciting, you know. They're like adrenaline packed, helicopters in, vehicles in, whatever. Mosul was just uh, an animal. Mosul was a living animal. It, it, was, it was, you know, you, you knew you were going to get in a fight. <laughs> you, we, and we were so thin, we were hitting, the targets started like hit one target, then that target led to two, then that two led to four, and then he found out, hey, these guys, these eight houses in this area are a cell, how do we hit all eight at once, okay? You know, in, in a SEAL team, you train for a whole platoon to do an entry. Right. Well, now you're like, you four guys are gonna hit this house, you four guys get in that house, you four, and you're trying to do it all simultaneous, then you're rearming, reloading, then you're going onto another target set that night. Good and, um, by the end of it, it was so bad, we weren't taking Humvees out anymore um, because IEDs, obviously, we were taking taxi cabs, garbage trucks, we had a bus, we had a bread truck. We were doing anything we could to just disappear in the city and then emerge. Sure. And um, at the very end, it was just so bad we were using the strikers because it was, you know, it was just, it was a war. Yeah. Yeah. You exit the gate and you're taking fire. Yeah. 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 Unbelievable. So when you got there, you said the FBI had the targets, so they had like 100 Plus yeah, so it was really weird, set. right? In, in, in Baghdad, all of our targets came from the agency or, or army intel, right? And uh, it, it was like, it was, very, it was very traditional. When we got to Mosul, literally these guys showed up and like, hey guys, F agency guys? They're like, no, we're FBI. I'm like, FBI? 
well, what are you doing here? Right. And it was just kind of comical that one of them was a former SEAL and he knew we were coming. And so had that relationship not existed, I don't know if we would have ever done the work we did in Mosul. And so they showed up, he was literally leaving and they came there like, we heard you guys can go hit targets. And it was funny, there was probably, because that troop had been sitting in Guam and I had flown there to get them trained and bring them back to Iraq. So they couldn't hit targets. Like five of us could hit targets. The rest of the guys have been sitting in Guam on vacation. So we were like, sure, we can do it. <laughs> like, yes. And uh, it was, you know, the first, first missions, we had the Polish Grom with us. So we would basically be the liaison with the Polish Grom. Grom would hit one target, then the eight of us would hit another target. And then when the, the rest of the guys came in, it was integration time. But it was literally, you know, trial by fire. Learn, learn with a garbage, with a fire hose. and. Yeah. Again, the kids did great. It, we had we had outstanding young men, and um, we just had a blast. It was it was real. It was um, every day, and uh, it was I call it you know compared to Afghanistan, I call I call it a gentleman's war, because it was literally like hey we're gonna go like twenty minutes over there, grab this dude, and we're gonna come back and hang out and party. Yeah. Where after Afghanistan, you're like we're gonna walk for five days, <laughs> get this guy, stay there for five days, and hopefully get home somehow. You know. And uh, Iraq was just totally, different. Mosul was, and we were it. We were the only show in town. Wow. So it was everybody, once we started working, uh, you know, we, like everybody, Tommy had to prove himself. We had to prove ourselves too. And one of our biggest missions was going after a guy named Hisham Al Ahmed. And so at that time, they were shooting down American helicopters in Iraq. Right. And so we got into that cell and started working our way through it and then got to Hisham Al Ahmed, who was the cell leader. And so Big Army wanted to watch, and this was probably maybe our fifth or sixth mission, mm -hmm. and it was a pretty complicated target. And so, you know, what, how are we gonna do it? It's a big, huge mansion, right? And right before we went on the, on the target, I was kind of just looking at the photos, I'm like, that wall looks really high. Because so I was looking at the car and looking at the wall, I'm like, that wall looks really high. And so I, I screenshot the license plate, turned it on its side and counted the license plates. It was a 12 foot wall. Oh. Well, our ladders are only six feet tall, right? right? And so I made sure we built brand new ladders we go over the wall and basically at this point I had been breaching for a while. I'd been through Baghdad and you know, I was a breaching instructor. I'd been a breacher all my career. So that part was not hard for me to do. Yeah. I had it, my system was down pretty fast. And so we go on target, get up to the, get up to the wall. And I was probably from the time my feet hit the ground to the charge went off about anywhere from eight to 12 seconds. Right. Um, and that was a pretty long delay because you know, some idiot came on the, the rule was never get on the radio once my feet were on the ground. Right. You know, the breacher has control at that point. And somebody got on the radio like, move the vehicles here. And here's me on the radio, clear the net, clear the net, turning steel, you know, and blew the charge. And basically as the guys float in, this, we had probably cleared that target in three minutes. And this general, I guess, was watching the feed. Right. And he was just like, what the fuck? You know, what is this? I can't wait. And they, everybody thought he was upset. He's like, I've never seen anything like that. And when we come out on the roof, we will always announce our presence. And right. so we would crash the roof to let the helicopters know we're coming out. And our guys in the, the helo to know, don't shoot us. Right, right. And so from the time that crash came out, his target secure, essentially, us coming out on the roof. And he, it was three minutes. And he, yeah. and he had just never seen anything like that. And we don't, us, we don't think we're moving fast at all. We're very methodical. Sure. And we're, we're dynamic until we go methodical, right? But when you start working with units, that's when you really realize the difference in training. I did a bunch of missions with Striker Brigade, and they're, they're great. They're good guys, but they just don't move as fast. Like, SEALs can, can think. And, you know, when you're a lower-ranking guy at a lower, less trained, you're waiting for people to tell you what to do. Right. And we don't have that problem. <clears throat> and so when we cleared these structures, our guys are just flowing and making decisions, you know, and rapidly moving in a in, in it's amazing how much happens but how little happens to us right and uh so this guy was just pretty and from that point on we never had any hindrance for missions ever again As, you know we were they were like a hard mission came up get those guys on the hook you know man that is fascinating can you unpack you just said something that i think it'd be super important to talk about you said we we're dynamic and then methodical yeah so Basically, you know, there's there's many different types of clearance. So there's tactics. Ta everybody has tactics. Everybody's tactics are the best. Ask them, they'll tell you, right? And uh, <laughs> right, like every football coach is the best. Just ask him, he'll tell you, right? <laughs> so uh, tactics are the same thing. But one of the big things we wanted to be was we wanted to be fast. Right. But as soon as shots got fired, we would go into methodical, very very slow clearance. And the number one rule is in the SEAL teams, we'd never run to our death. 
right? And so we're moving very fast, clearing very fast, leaving guys in rooms to do the searches and the team is just constantly flowing. We, we can adopted a Polish tactic where instead of saying we're gonna clear the first floor and then clear the second floor, we clear them both at the same time. Right. So we literally had a team blow by everything just to get to the staircase, get to get as high up in that building as you can get, right. as fast as you can get, get the high ground. Because yep. if they shoot down on you, yeah. and we learned that because in Baghdad one night, we had hit a simultaneous target and the SF guys that were next door to us had grenades dropped on their head and four guys died, right? And so our, from that point on, we were like, we just want, we want to own this structure as Absolutely. fast as possible. And we have an entire seal element of, you know, basically 20 shooters, you can do that. And so our thing was go as fast as you can go, not running, but moving really quickly wow. through rooms. And then as soon as shots get fired, then you're, okay, what do we got? You know, and then it's crash it, concussion grenade, whatever you got to do to move. And it's literally then we're moving room to room, laying down your base, whatever you have to do, but it's still very methodical. And, and if you, you'd have to come in a room with me and Tommy sometime where you'll just see us just pieing and just eating little tiny pieces of the pie. And then what pieces of the pie? And then it's like, I need two guys. I want you to go, okay, two guys go. And then, and then we're moving little tiny pieces of the pie. Right. Because when you're patient, bad guys are impatient. That's right. And eventually it's just, I'm going to be patient. I'm in no rush. I'm in no rush to die, you know, and you win that way. Don't but the speed is your friend. Violence of action is your friend. You'd be violent and you're fast until you can't. And when you can't, then you'd be methodical. You know? That's incredible. <clears throat> that type of thought process, Tom, is exactly, I mean, we're seeing people, especially in this country, because this is the only one I get to go to right now. <laughs> with everything going on with COVID-19 and, and all of that. But with, with people crippled by fear and not taking any action, it's been a conversation we've been talking about. Um, but that thought process where it's in the training, right? And your training sets you up to be able to do that. And you did it so many times, so many thousands of times, and you weren't waiting on someone to tell you what to do. And, and, and I think that a lot of people get stuck in that. They're waiting for someone to tell them to yeah. take action. I, had a, I was very lucky. You know, the, the SEAL teams ebb and flow when it comes to leadership, right. right? I was very, very lucky in that my first platoon I did, the leadership in that platoon was probably nothing that anybody will ever experience again in the SEAL teams. My OIC, officer in charge, mm -hmm. had four platoons, which is unheard of. Right, so he was on his fourth platoon, tw two times as a platoon commander. He's now one of the most highly decorated case officers in agency history. Wow. My platoon chief had nine deployments. My LPO was on his sixth. Everybody else was on their third, and then there was us new guys. So now in the teams, you could probably be a chief on your third deployment. Right. My platoon chief had nine. Wow. So what I learned in that platoon was one, be the best at basics, but two, the only bad decision you can ever make is indecision. <laughs> and Georgie would just preach that to us. He's like, don't wait for me to tell you what to do. Just do it. If you screw it up, who cares? Fix just it fix it. Yep. You know, but don't just stand there with your hands in your pocket and go, what he's like, they? that's not, and they, he would just say it. Don't, you're, you're a seal. Solve problems. Yeah. And, just, and if you, I want, he just tell, I want you to screw it up. Wow. You know, and but don't just stand there and be wait to be told what to do. And it came from it was everything. It came from throwing the trash. I mean, we were we were treated very harshly. But I look at it now, and it was just awesome. Like to be able to be told, go clean the toilets. It's very humbling. But then you go, I get it. Never be bigger than the than the smallest task. And, and when we were a shipboarding platoon, so back in the day, like I told you earlier, seals floated. So we floated on ships, and that's all we did was CQB. It's a CQC now, but CQB back in the day. And um, so clearance was just second nature, but that was, you, these ships are so big, you'd end up getting separated and have to, you know, kind of um, caterpillar, slinky. So some of the team before, you're kind of catching up. You're in the, if you're rear security, you're just running the entire time, getting guys out of the rooms and getting back in the train. And that's all George would say, just make a decision. Keep going, don't stop, don't stop. Momentum is our friend, right? And in business, now that I'm in business, that's my message I'm always trying to say. Just go, keep moving, keep, keep thinking, keep bringing new ideas because only bad decisions is indecision. That's right. That's one of the unique things. Tom, Tom came by after he was working with our organization for a little bit, and I think he just stopped by one day to say hello or something. We were in one of our company meetings. Thirsty. 
That was Thursday? No, <laughs> no I, was, was, I was thirsty. Oh, you were thirsty. <laughs> yeah, we got a fridge full of drinks. <laughs> but uh, but he stopped by one day and I was like, come in, man, sit in, our, sit in our company meeting. And we've developed that environment, even though neither one of us were in the military, but we've developed that environment because any job that I had in the corporate world or any, any place that I worked out of, it was more like authoritarian and people were scared to make mistakes. And so they did nothing until they were told what to do. And that cogs up everything. Fear is paralyzing. It's paralyzing. And, and whether, I mean, that was real fear that you guys were facing, but. Uh, not really. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's no, there's no difference. Right. I don't think there's any, you see it as a difference, but I was listening to the, you know, one is I like to hear other SEALs tell stories and because I don't get to hear them anymore. I get mm -hmm. to hear my own bullshit over a period of time. Uh, then you probably I also, started to believe it. Yeah. I, well, no, I don't, I don't believe my own <laughs> stuff anymore. I have to be checked all the time. But I was trying to also listen to what, how other people hear that story or, you know, a, mm -hmm. a, a, a very complex story. It's so basic. It's basic. Very. Do, do you ever do anything that was super advanced? Like whatever the fuck word advanced You know, I is. look at things now and I'm like, holy crap, did we do that? But at the time, they're not advanced because it's, it's just so, it's a piece of a pie. Yeah, right. Like we're going to jump out of a plane with a duck, get on the duck, drive in a certain way, go on dive status, go across, go, go to dive status, cross the beach, go back on dive status, plan a limpet, come back, blah, blah, revert, but land, get back to a submarine. Now, you look at that and you're like, holy crap. But to me, it's just pieces of a pie. Yeah, right. and I'm, I, it's a very complex thing when, you, when you're 30,000 feet looking down or if you're watching ISR coverage or that hoo-ha colonel that was watching that going, oh my gosh, that was great. To the guy doing it, it's so elementary level. Mm -hmm. And it's only it's do what quick, you're... Uh, to me, it's only do the basic stuff and mm -hmm. do it rapid. But the guy never, never occurs to me that I, I never ran in combat ever. I don't ever remember, I remember being exhausted, but never running and never yelling. Like you see in the movies, hey, move, go. None of that shit. You probably yelled, but my, I never. I, I yelled I, to get people's attention, but mo I, I was always one of those guys to talk to myself first. Right. Calm down. Yeah, always Calm slow down. down, slow down, slow Calm down. down, slow down. And then I would talk. Because it, it, it's a funny story how that happened. It wasn't because I'm this great, you know, it was, I called myself on the radio one night. <laughs> We, yeah, we were, we were getting the shit handed to us, and I'm like, Taco, Taco! <laughs> I called myself on the radio. It was one of my first, you know, my first good fights, and I called myself on the radio. I have two funny stories like that, but, uh, and Joe Morales, brand new guy, he's like, Taco, you're calling yourself on the radio. <laughs> yeah, but if you had answered that, would have been that funny shit right there. And so, I, yeah. I literally, you know, you, you go from, you go from, oh, you know, it's just, yeah. and that's the SEAL team. So, like, brand new guys, like, you're calling yourself on the radio. And you're just like, I no. just called myself on the radio, didn't I? <laughs> Do you remember what you were thinking? Uh, I was, you know, I was thinking this, we're in a really, really bad position right now. The, the vehicles were in L, and the guys shooting at us were between us. And um, I saw it coming. Right. So, I, we, had, we had made the turn. I saw the guys, and I was like... And I'm trying to get on the radio to tell the guy, stop, stop, stop. And then they, I couldn't get in contact with them. And then I saw these guys come guns up, myself and Eric Muller deployed. Shooting started. When we got back in the vehicle, we started getting shot at. And so I was trying to call them to say, hey, we're, we're going here. And they weren't answering, but I was basically saying, Taco, Taco. You know, because you're bloody, your heart oh, is yeah, going. Yeah, yeah. You know, Eric Muller cool. just launched a rocket. You know, we just we just initiated, and it, it's a gunfight, and yeah. we were in civilian cars, soft skin cars. We're in civilian clothes, and it you know, the, there's an army element about a mile away. I'm like, this is just everything is bad right now. Yeah. You know, our, our entire safety was disguise. Right. Our entire safety was not getting gunfights, yeah. right? Right. And now we're in one, and we're in the worst situation possible. They're between the two elements, yeah. and, and you know, and I heard the the trail vehicle. I probably what got me really spun up is I saw the trail vehicle, Andre Gomez, it's all on video too. I saw Andre Gomez hit it in reverse and I heard the tire screech. And I'm like, did they just flip? Uh, mm -hmm. And so, you know, it, it, I, I, I just called myself on the radio basically. You know, I, I, don't, I don't know what to, I, my thought process was how, what's going on with my guys, I guess. I don't know. You're I would, trying to orchestrate it. This you, is you know, I'm, you know I'm the element, I'm the, lead, I'm the element leader and I'm like, 
I'm now I'm in the biggest, the, this, this, the, Tommy and I were talking about it, that like, once they're between you, you're in a bad position, right. you know, because we're always trained. Don't shoot the guy dressed like you. Well, now they're right between us and we're in an L and I'm, I got buildings all the way down one side of me. I got people running at us down the street. I have a vehicle that just went in reverse it's to get any shot at. This is not what I had planned. And so then it literally, you know, after I calmed myself down about two, three seconds later, go to the plan. What's the plan? Let's get to the rally point. Yeah. Right. Let's get to the rally point. You know, you find the basic elements that are so frustrating to find when you, when you try to orchestrate things and what I realized in the, in the teams starting at team two and then going to, to, to be an instructor. If you have to explain yourself, it's already lost. It's already over. You're, you're done. So yeah, I have a, I have a rule for that. And I, I've used this rule my entire career. And it's it, it makes sure that I, I make sure that I'm when I'm talking, people understand what I'm saying and that they understand what my breaking point is. And it's very simple. If I tell you something once and you don't hear me, it's my fault because I didn't tell you direct enough. If right. I tell you something twice, you didn't hear me. It's my fault because I didn't stress the importance of what I was trying to tell you. If I tell you something a third time, you didn't hear me. It's your fault. Cause you're too stupid to listen to me the first two times. <laughs> right. And that's that's the way I was raised in SEAL teams. Right. L listen, hear it, do it. Yeah ask questions later. And one of my biggest pet peeves, and I'm sure it was his too, is I, I had a guy in, 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 up in Mosul that I had a confrontation with another SEAL because nothing bothers me more than somebody showing up to the plan and then interjecting. If you're not part of the plan, if you're gonna be in your room sleeping, don't show up to the plan and start giving me your thoughts. Right. That's the wrong time to do it. We're getting ready to go out the door. Right. And they need, to hear, they need to hear commonality and unison in the plan. That's right. And so that's my biggest pet peeve is be part of the planning or just shut up. Because I, I don't care. And then if you don't like what the plan was, when we're done, then tell me. Give it to me. I want to hear it. I want to yeah, tell yeah. you. Tell me everything I did wrong. But don't tell me before we've done it because you weren't part of it. Man, you just voiced that. <clears throat> that is how I feel. Oh, my <laughs> gosh. Man, when we put a plan together and then somebody tries to interject like how this should have been done or that should have been done or this is the way we should do it, oh, it makes me want to come unglued. Mm -hmm. As though the plan was just whipped together. In As though we seconds. just, yeah, 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 no, we just. But, but I think it's such an interesting, interesting parallel to, to business in general, especially business right now, because I feel like so many people are trying to be methodical first before they have the ability to be dynamic. And what they're doing in that methodical process is they're coming up with problems that don't even yet exist. Mm -hmm. That oh, you can't solve true. until yeah. you start moving. Yeah, but you like, never move because you can't solve. And like what you yeah. said, when you go to a when you get to a building and you've got four buildings you're trying to take and all this other stuff, you're not thinking about that. You're just thinking, I got to get to this part of this room, and then I got to get to right here, then I got to get to right there. But most people are thinking about, I've got four buildings I got to take. I got to do this, 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 this. I need to plan all this out. I need to know everything, and then I'll be dynamic but you'll never get there yeah no how far ahead would you well, uh, other than planning meaning when you're sitting around the table planning out before you go into the field uh, once you're in the field how far did you try to look forward tactically i know strategic is a different thing 100 meters i always yeah. knew with 100 meters i, I had my head always had the plan in my head like the plan for me, I, and this has probably come off the wrong way, but I'll make sure this is how it worked for me. I never really looked at timelines because I knew timelines were going to change. That was just a guideline for me. Right. The plan was a guideline of what, in a perfect scenario, was going to happen. Right. Like I knew where I was going to get dropped off, which is probably going to not happen. They're probably going to drop me off the wrong place. So, cool. I knew what I thought where I was going to walk that way, but then the barbed wire fence is going to decapitate me, so that's going to change yeah. too. Right, right. The, where the door I was supposed to go into is probably going to be barricaded. So yeah. it was just a guideline. Right. And so for me, it was literally 100 meters at a time because it's always developing. I'm always just looking. Yeah. I'm like, where, where are my guys? Mm -hmm. What do I have? Okay, here's what I have right now. And my entire thing was always, you know, anticipation is great. Some people can do it better. My thing was understand that something's going to happen right. and so if you're prepared for it if you're prepared for that guy to come around the corner to shoot you or whatever scenario you know right. in business whatever i'm prepared for failure i plan for failure right i do not plan for success success is easy i plan for failure that way i'm never surprised by it and that's one of the messages i always try to send the kids that i train to go to buds now mm -hmm. is don't be don't show up to buds be surprised by the intensity to me there's nothing more embarrassing than going to buds and quitting right. like you you train to be a seal 
you went to SEAL training and then you quit? Like it wasn't what I thought it would be. <laughs> yeah. On what day did you one. What did you think it would be? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. the hardest military training in the world, considered you know some people's opinion. It the attrition rate of ten to twenty five percent. What were you expecting? And so my big thing is never be surprised by the situation. And so if I look at it, you know, I'm dealing with it right now in a big business situation, obviously, I look at it and go, why are you surprised this is happening? Right. You know, I, and I'm not. I, I, I thrive in those moments. I really look forward to when things are kind of going chaotic for me to be, not because I, I can solve problems, but it's like, okay, this is, I'm gonna solve the, I'm gonna, I'm gonna move these glasses here and that's the problem I just dealt with at that moment. Right. My, phone, my eyes are blurry, I'm gonna put my glasses on. I literally think that way. I'm very, very simpl simplistic in my thinking, mm -hmm. knowing that if I solve the, the first problem in front of me, I'll solve the hundredth problem. Yeah. You know, and but if you look at them all, <clears> the fear you can't even you can't purple. even get started. Yeah. yeah. You yeah. know, and that's the thing is, it happened to me the other night. It's I'm, I'm just a normal human being, right? There's nothing different between me and anybody else. So I had yeah. a huge windstorm in I Nashville. Call him the Green Lantern. <laughs> <laughs> I had a I had a huge windstorm in Nashville the other day, massive windstorm. You know, and, and we actually got caught in the middle of it. We almost got killed. Tree fell down in front of us. My wife and my son, we all had to run. And um, a lot of things happened. But basically, long story short, after the windstorm was over, uh, I showed up to my house two nights ago because I had to immediately go down to Fort Lauderdale and, and do a, a, a meeting. And I came in there, my yard is just covered in branches and broken limbs and fallen trees. And I, I sat there and it's like six o'clock at night. I'm like, <sighs> and then I just cleaned. I'm like, I'm just going to clean this. And my wife's like, you know, just do it tomorrow. I'm like, no, I don't have time tomorrow. And so I started cleaning this section. And it was bend over, pick it, you can't rake the crap, you know, pick it up, put it in the wheelbarrow, go dump the wheelbarrow on the, you know, they come pick their stuff up in the corner. And, and an hour and a half later, the yard was clean. And you just did it piece of pie at a time. I just did a piece of pie. And that's the only way it works for me because yeah. I'm not smart enough to do 27 things. Yeah. But if I can do 27 singular things, mm -hmm. like I'm not gonna go and over, it's, I can't overlap. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna do this knowing that this is here and then I'm going to do this, you know, and, and I used to try to, and I, that would probably tell you why there was 20 years of failure before I had any success, but I used to try to what I would call it is I would put so many actors on the stage of my mind. And, and when I realized that if I have one actor on the stage of my mind, that's a hundred percent of my capabilities or thinking process or, or whatever my, my, my capabilities, when I put two up there, people think you split it and it's 50%, 50%, but it's not. It's like 30, 30. You lose like 40% yeah, of your effectiveness. And when I realized that, that's when I was like, okay, I'm only going to do one thing at a time. I don't care what's going on. I don't care if the phone's ringing. I don't care if this is happening. I don't care if the kids are crying. This is the thing I'm doing right now. And I can almost track it to the day when, when things started turning around in business. And, and it's fascinating hearing you talk about that and, and hearing how you've translated. So what's your business now? What do you do right now? I'm the chief of staff for American Addiction Centers. Awesome. So we have nine hospitals across the country. And uh, my, I came there, you know, my story is long, but basically I came there, uh, I want to help veterans mm -hmm. with addiction and mental health disorders. And uh, I was doing That's it on my own. He's attracted to me. <laughs> I was getting ready to say. It's like, now I, feel I, bad. I have now, to show up. Now I know why you're here. Yeah. It's um, just an intervention. I, you know, I, 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 I treated my first patient, which was me. And um, I came, you know, like any SEAL, uh, I, I suffered a traumatic brain injury. You know, and in the SEAL teams, you have guys, those of us who suffered major ones, and then every SEAL suffered minor ones. And minor ones are the biggest one. Yet there's no it is overlooked, right? Well, because you you don't you can't you don't know they're there. They take a long time to develop. Yeah. They're called microblast injuries from breaching, 50 cals, rockets, you name it. Oh, yeah. And uh, I managed mine for a long time. Like I dealt with it. I I had headaches. I had all those you know emotional stuff. Whatever. Right. My wife got very sick, and I went down a very dark hole. And the dark hole that I went down to when I fed it with alcohol mm -hmm. made my brain go crazy. And I, and I didn't never lose. Nobody knew. That was the thing is I handled it, but I knew I was losing my mind. I'm like, I'm losing my mind. Right. Um, I can't read or write an email anymore. I can't concentrate. I can't. I, I'm just angry all the time. Sure. I tried many, many different things to fix myself and I would be fixed for a little while and then I would be bad. And I fueled it with alcohol, tremendous amount of alcohol, you know, 
And uh, if you're gonna do it, overdo it. You know do it, overdo it. <laughs> yeah, and you don't, don't, don't do it soft. Yeah, you know? the thing is, I had money too, right? Yeah. So I worked for I worked for a, a company, a, a, a splinter of Google, and I made a lot of money. Mm -hmm. And so I could feel it with the best Don Julio, et cetera, et cetera, right? Et cetera, <laughs> et cetera. <laughs> and uh, the great thing for me is I was never I never got into drugs. Mm -hmm. I couldn't take pills because um, pills I couldn't poop. And I couldn't, I couldn't have that's sex. The reason why I'm, that's, that's the only reason why I'm not addicted to painkillers. Yeah, that's exactly it, right? Seriously. I could That was it. Like I couldn't poop, and I, I couldn't, I couldn't get yeah. an erection. So I'm not going to take painkillers, right? I like having sex. So, right. So drug, alcohol was my big thing, and um, I knew I was having a problem. And by the time it got to a place where it was overwhelming me, I basically got sat down at work and said, "The only reason you have a job right now is because your wife has cancer." And so I went from the year before being the number one employee mm -hmm. to basically being told, you only have a job here because your wife has cancer. And here's me the whole time going, I don't know what's the matter with me. And so I decided to go seek therapy. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I did the therapy. I did it with a serious mind. Mm -hmm. It was the most embarrassing thing I've ever done because the fact that I had to say I needed help was the worst day of my life. The second worst day of my life was the drive to there. Right. And during that drive, I was absolutely gutted mm -hmm. I cried like I've never cried before I was just embarrassed and the great thing for me is I went to therapy with those seals mm -hmm. right and that's one thing for us we don't talk about that like it's ugh, all men right men right, just don't right, talk right. with seals we definitely don't talk because suck it up buttercup right? right and so I went I did it and I was very very clear with the understanding of the acceptance that everything that was happening was my fault I very much looked in the mirror and I said, this guy didn't cheat you, that guy didn't rob you, you let them. And I'm, I'm, if anything, my buddy Chris Smith, he always tells me, you're too giving. Mm -hmm. you're too, you let people f screw you over. Right. And so, but I, but I accepted it. I looked at it, I really dug deep, and I found out that I had no PTSD from the war. I really enjoyed being at war. I was very much comfortable being there. Sure. My PTSD was something that made me a SEAL which was, I had a lot of childhood stuff. Right. I knew it had happened, yeah. but I, that was just life. Mm -hmm. My mom was a, was a hardworking woman, but my mom's uh, addiction was men. And those men that came in her life treated her badly, treated us badly, and I started abusing grown men when I was 14. So they no longer beat me, I beat them. Right. And uh, that made me a seal though, like, right? Like, you can not starve me. You can't beat me. You can't freeze me. You're definitely not going to say anything I've never heard before. Right. So bring it. But when that happens at a young age, it obviously formulates sure. a lot of anger in your old life. My, mine was not, I was never a, a boo hoo what was me. I was just full of hate. Sure. Hatred, right? Like I hated human beings. God, I can't even see that looking at you. Yeah, yeah. But so I know it because that was my story. It was very easy for me to be cruel to men, right? Like I had no problem being cruel to men. All men were my enemy. If you weren't a SEAL, you were my enemy. I wouldn't even speak to people, right? And so when you're a businessman... That's business what man, I liked about it. <laughs> <laughs> now, now, now he's gone. some other yeah. dude. Now he's so, some whatever. You know, and when you're a businessman <laughs> owning gyms, <laughs> you're, you're putting this... I called it my fake face. I would walk into my... Yeah, I own gyms. gyms. Okay. I'd walk into my gyms and I'd put my fake face on because I loved coaching. Sure. I love coaching kids. Mm -hmm. I love coaching. I hated being a businessman mm -hmm. because I hate liars. I hate right. people that actively will lie to you over money. Yeah. And I encounter that hundreds of times in, in, as a gym owner, right? And so I went to therapy, I did it, and I came out and I just had this, my backpack was emptied. PTSD is just bricks in a backpack. Every okay. single person on earth has PTSD and everybody focuses on the last brick. Mm -hmm. My last brick was my wife, but really there was a pile of bricks and I emptied those bricks out. I then went and Tyler does this sound familiar <laughs> I did a training one time and it was and it was based off of what I was going through because yeah. I'm never gonna talk somebody expect them to be vulnerable if I haven't first walked that road myself and we did a we did an entire training on dropping your rocks mm -hmm. on emptying that sack out yeah because it'll keep you from wherever you want to go yeah and I, 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 I did it and I I got very into it after that. Like, I want to learn more because right. I felt so good. Right. I was like, fuck, it felt so good. You know, like I was happy. I didn't know. I really, I really in my entire life don't believe I was ever happy. Right. And I, and one of the big things for me as a seal, there's something written on the wall at Bud says, be someone special. I never, ever felt that. Right. I never, I always felt like a visitor in the seal teams. Like I would look at other guys and look at the Tom Shays like, 
man, I hope they don't find out that I'm a phony. That I'm a fraud. Mm-hmm. I hope yeah, they don't. How many times have we talked like, about like this? They, I hope they don't figure yeah. out that I'm barely hanging on by a string. Like, because I would see guys like, you know, uh, Rob Reeves and, you know, Mark Carter and all these guys who, you know, that most of them guys are gone now, but they were tremendous human beings. Yeah. And, I, and I would look at these guys and like, I'm not a quarter of them. Like Jocko Willink. Like I, I did my first platoon with Jocko and mm-hmm. have, I, Jocko is the real deal. He's a neat guy, man. Right? Like he's the he real deal. Like I went stars. to combat with Jocko and I, it, when Jocko was an E5, Jocko was the best SEAL I had ever met. Wow. And I, and I was just like, I hope they don't figure out that I'm like hanging on by a thin thread. Right? right? And uh, <clears throat> I then got very into the, the understanding of what was going on in my brain. Mm-hmm. And I started researching. I'm kind of a nerd. And I then went to stem cell therapy, and that's when I had this epiphany. <clears throat> I understood that by not feeling my not not feeling my body with a poison and alcohol, mm-hmm. and then healing my body with the true nature of the injury, which was at the joints, yeah. I had my life just got better. Mm-hmm. And then I really started always telling myself positive mental attitude. Now we hear it all the time, but I never yeah. believed. I never did it. Right. And I really started saying, "Those problems aren't your problems. Don't let that bother you." Who cares if that person cut you off? And I would just have conversations with myself. And I, every day I was, felt a little better. I felt a little better. And I just, I came back and I was working for, on Sergey Brin's personal staff. Mm-hmm. And uh, I got asked to start helping other veterans. And I started helping other guys. And it, it, it just made me feel good. Mm-hmm. It made me feel good to sit with guys, tell them what I had just done, not talk about the better life. Just like I went and got, I got help. Right. And you can too. And let me help you. And it was amazing how many guys called me. Mm-hmm. Guys who I did my whole career with, guys who were not young SEALs, older right. SEALs, mm-hmm. and little by little, three, and then five, and then next thing I was really overwhelmed. And um, I called Michael Cartwright, who I had met at a SEAL fit event years ago, beating him, the, beating the piss out of him. You know, he had, a, he had a midlife crisis and always wanted to be a SEAL, so I tortured him for a weekend, you know? I called him up, I'm like, you own, you own all these addiction <laughs> centers, I have a bunch of my friends who need help. He's like, well, we don't... We really don't dabble in the VA. We try it. We just don't know how to do it, et cetera. And I'm like, well, I know people. I called. One thing led to another. And uh, the day I got promoted at, at um, Global Support Development, which is a private humanitarian team at Google, um, I told I was with Michael. And I'm like, I just got promoted to chief of staff. He's like, screw that. Come work for me. And I remember kind of sitting there and he's like, anything you want. Tell me what you want. And, you know, I'm at a point now where, you know, I, I make money mm-hmm. but that's not my focus anymore right. when i was focused on money i was miserable right and now that i'm not focused on it, i make more than i've ever made but i don't care right like i drive a toyota i i wear a broken garmin watch yep. and i wear t-shirts and jeans like that's that's my gig right so i went home and talked to my wife for a long time like this is gonna be a very a very massive financial change to us yeah. you know when you work at google you make money right. you, you have a base salary but your bonuses are crazy the benefits are crazy yeah. they take and care of people. they take care of people they get very good care of people and i and i i basically said i want to help people and so i went to american addiction centers and have now been there and i went there michael's my friend and he was very clear he's like this company's struggling i don't know how long we're going to be here so i'll make sure i have an exit plan for you don't don't burn your bridges there make sure you do it the right way and uh, he's like but i really need your help man that's honorable and so i i went there and what I discovered was, and Michael loved to tell me this all the time. He's like, you, you don't know this business. You, you're a small business guy. I'm like, there's the toilet paper costs the same, bro. And you right. pay triple for it. Right. And that's the way I attacked the problem. Yeah. I didn't attack it because he was always like, we got to make more money. got to make more money. I'm like, you got to stop spending money. Right. And the holes up the first. First. it was just, a, it was, a, it was a leaking yeah. bucket. And little by little, I started plugging tiny holes, holes that never really thought about like, Shredded boxes. Shredded boxes are the first things I had. I'm like, we pay two twenty five per shredded box. We have sixteen shredded boxes. Why? We only need one per department. Well, you know, it's, I don't care about convenience. I've always been that guy. Yeah. Copier machines. I think we had a thousand copiers for four thousand employees. What? <laughs> you know, so free co- free coffee. I'm like, you want coffee? You can go to Starbucks. Right. And I just attacked problems. You know, uh, shirts, embroidered shirts. I'm like, do we wear a uniform? No. Well, then we're not paying thirty five dollars for a Nike embroidered shirt, giving it away to the employees. Right. And I started attacking every little problem like that to the point where I got to a point where we had started cutting millions of dollars off. And the final part was the the IT budget, which IT is the biggest budget for everybody. Redundancy. So convenience was the big, big thing. Well, Slack is convenient. We have Microsoft Teams. Yeah, but 
boom. Well, you can't have both. Well, we have Zoom and we have go to meet Microsoft Teams. I'm like, get rid of all redundancy gone away. And um, probably upset people along the way, but I just, I don't care about that. No. My, I had a focus that I'm going that's, to. That's obvious. Th- th- you know, there's, <laughs> like my, my goal was I want to, I want to have a company where I can treat my friends. And if this company keeps going, it's going to be gone. It'll be gone. And so I just eliminated a lot of stuff. And the final part, which was the focus that Michael brought me into was change the leadership, mm-hmm. evaluate leaders. That was the, one of the very final things I did. And because the focus was on downsizing the workforce mm-hmm. and it was all about cutting 30 to $50,000 employees. I'm like, hang on, that's your workers. And, and I just kind of looked at it going, let me start reading people's emails, yeah. not reading them, but just how many emails did, did this guy get today? How many did he answer? Mm-hmm. Oh, I got three and he answered one. So this is a vice president. I pay him 200 G's and he got three answered one. Okay, give me now, give me the week. And I literally started looking at that. And I go, okay, who's the guy below him? Let me look at his. That guy had got 100, answered 120. Mm. What's he make? What's he make? And, and I got rid of pretty much every VP in the company and every director in the company. And then I gave the managers below them raises. Yep. And we cut, by the time it was done, $117 million off the budget oh, with very little effort. Very, very little effort. Mm-hmm. And, you know, now we've, we've cut another $7 million off. We're, now we're finding new avenues of revenue through, you know, stuff that was always there. We, we just signed a contract with NFL alumni. Mm-hmm. I brought in my friends, um, guys who I know are great leaders. They're not, they're not the smartest guys, but what they are is they're, they're men. They they're, they're family men. Yeah. They, they love the people around them. They treat people well. And that, right. People don't understand how, that, how you can invigorate a workforce by treating people well. Mm-hmm. You, know, you can be the smartest asshole in the room. You and just that'll, cre- that'll create a culture that will yeah. cripple a con- company and it's gone. Yeah. It's gone. I mean, look at Elon, Mu- look at Elon Musk's senior leadership staff to turn over because he works them to death. Yeah. You got a guy who sleeps under his desk and expects you to do the same. Well, you're going to, you, people will go to Tesla to get a job to go somewhere else. That's right. And you look at these companies, a lot of those companies, they get a job there to go somewhere else, mm. you know? So I approach it and I'm, how do I brought my friends in guys who I look at for mentorship. Right. Derek Price is a big mentor, family mentor for me. Cause I look at the way he treats his wife yeah. and I'm like, I strive to treat my wife the way Derek treats his wife. He opens the door for her everywhere he goes. And I asked him one day, I'm like, why do you, you know, like you walked around the car to open the door for your wife. He's like, that's my queen. Mm-hmm. And that, that struck me. Little things strike me. Right. And so as I've come into this company, I've come in with that attitude mm-hmm. that I'm not going to change a company to change Dan. If I can change Dan, because I know who Dan was for 20 years. Dan was a jerk for 20 years. I ruined, I blame myself for absolutely everything. Mm -hmm. I mean, I look at things that I said and did in the past. I'm like, and I look at it from a very realistic standpoint. Everything that I did wrong was either the day I was drunk or the next day. Mm -hmm. Right. And I've cut that out of my life. I've been sober now for well over a year. That's incredible. I look at anger and I go, you, you allowed anger to rule you. So every time you were given a great opportunity, sale of the year, sale of the quarter, you're the one that screwed up. I never got one of those awards, even though I was nominated every time because I would go and be floating on top of the world and be like, this, ah, this piece of crap, blah, blah, blah. at the wrong time, wrong place. People are like, that's not our sale of the year, sale of the quarter. Right. And I did it right. to myself. And I, I look at that now from a very realistic standpoint going the last 20 years, the failure of the last 20 years is going to teach me to be the success of the next 20 years. Yeah. I love that failure. Oh, yeah. I, I'm so thankful for it mm-hmm. because I'm like, I was so immature. I was such an immature seal. Mm-hmm. I was such an immature businessman. And now I go, that was the best thing I ever learned. Like I said, I learned more from bad leadership yeah. than I ever learned from good leadership. Right. And I look at that now and I go, I've made that mistake. Don't do it again. Like I typed the email the other day. I typed it and I read it and I'm like, Delete. I probably should do that right. more often. <laughs> like, I oh did. my God. I, 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 uh. I typed it, mm-hmm. I read it, yeah. and I deleted it. Yeah. And I sat there and I go, this will do. And I was, I was happy. Mm-hmm. I got it out. It's out. Yeah. Don't hold it in. But it ain't going to change it. Yeah. That guy is unchangeable. Right. You're, you're a, nearly a 60 year old man. You work for me. I'm 13 years your junior. You answer to me. There's a reason for it. There's a reason, There's a reason for it. So me typing an email, saying the truth, I'm just gonna make a change. That's all I'm gonna do. 
That's it. You've, I've, I have what I need to know that you have peaked out at the ability of your level right. and now I'm going to make a change right. and I'm moving on. Get on the train or get out of the way. I'll carry you. I'll pick you up and put you on the yeah. train. I have no problem doing that. But if you are trying to push, hold up the train, I'm going to run you over. I love it. The way he's talking is like he is telling our story. Mm -hmm. You're telling our business story. You're telling my story. Um, that's you, what you had said, uh, so gosh, I, you know, I've done a bunch of consulting and one of the things I look for is the, the prime meetings of a company. Go into these big meetings that they have every freaking day or their prime meetings during the week and see how it plays out. And it has to play out to me like in the combat platoon hut. Everybody has a seat at the table and there's no authority. Like you're the breacher. I listen to you like you're, you're God. You're the sniper. I listen to you like you're God. And probably sat in 80 big meetings to four to 500 companies. And I walk out of them going, I, I can bet against this company. There's nothing being said here relevant. Time drain. Time. And so I, I, Joe invites me into this meeting. Cause I had no intent to sit in there, so he'd come in and sit. I'm like, I just saw him outside oh pilfering through our refrigerator. And I was like, hey, Tom, <laughs> bring that drink you're stealing in here. And so I sat in and I was dumbfounded that it was like a, uh, a team guy meeting. And the, you know, Amanda's his COO, runs the company. She runs the company. I'm like, that's the way it's supposed to go. It's not the boss going there and, and being dictated, you know, dictating anything. And it, it was very fluid and everybody had a say. And you actually just changed some things that were, you know, I, I prioritized, boom, this is what we're gonna do. And I was like, that's lethal. And then I started doing more butt sniffing and sniffing of what Joe was up to. And it was all centered around the people of his company. And they just happened to have a product that they sell that's secondary to the people. I'm like, man, that was what the teams were like. It was all about the, the platoon. And you happen to go either in the water or in air or wherever they throw you. I don't care. We're just going to keep the team alive. And then where we go, it doesn't matter. That's, that's the big thing that I, I take into the, the job that I have now is in the teams, we didn't care about the mission. Right. Like, we, we don't care. You want us to go on a garbage? I did garbage truck missions. I've rowed a boat. I've taken a taxi cab. I've walked. I've, I've done everything you can think of in the teams. I didn't do a free fall mission. I was the only one that never did, right? And we never talked about that. It was us. Yeah, like, right. we looked at each other. They, they give us a task. Like, it was never like, can you do it? Like, people did it. Like, you guys can do it. Like, it just kind of like looked at like, did you just ask that question? Yeah. It's us. Yeah. And I'm trying to get people at my company, and I'm, I'm, I'm so lucky. I work for a guy right now, our new CEO named Andrew McWilliams. Andrew's a money guy, mm -hmm. and I love money guys because they're data-driven, right. right? Andrew is soft-spoken. I just saw him lose his temper the other day. It was awesome. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> and you know, I've been trying to get Tyler to lose his temper for years. Right? And, but I can talk to Andrew because I know money. I talk money, and Andrew's data-driven. Here's the data. Go. And Andrew basically is like, that's my go. Okay, and here's the problem. Go. And I go. And I look at Andrew, Karen Abbott, who's our chief legal officer, and Dr. Uh, Larry Weinstein, who's our chief medical officer, and I look around that room, I'm like, I'm amongst team guys right now because they're all just dragons. They're all fire breathing. And, you know, there's, there's people on the team who, when I came in, I was told to get rid of them. Mm -hmm. Not on the leadership team, but a little bit lower. Mm -hmm. And I now look at some of those guys, I'm like, all you needed was a hug. Yeah. I have a kid on my team. And when I first came in, literally, I was told, go find his replacement. And I'm like, hold on, that's not the way I work. Nobody makes my opinion for me. I, I learned that the hard way. And I analyzed this kid for a, for a while. And what I found out is he's brilliant, but he had been beaten down, mm -hmm. beaten down, overridden, and not backed up. And so I made a, a, a decision that is uh, probably could have cost me my job because the person I, I stood up against is like a protected employee. Like, sure, sure. And I, I don't care. You're not, man. Like, you, yeah. like, fire me. I'm just telling you the truth. Tyrant, good guy. Yeah. And good guy answers to me. Nobody tells him anything to do. Right. Nobody. And he is a, just a rock star. Mm, he just solved a, he solved a problem this week that, is the, that the financial benefit of that problem will resonate for two years. We, I gave him a task. I'm like, because well, you know, I run hospitals. Mm -hmm. And one of our hospitals, a significant amount of the nurses have walked off the job. Sure. And 
it affects our revenue, right? It affects the amount of people we can help, which is the mission, but you know, we have to keep the lights on. Right. And I'm like, I need you to find me five nurses by Monday. And this was on Wednesday. Yesterday, send me an email. I have you five. They start on Monday. Mm. And it was, and I look at that and I'm like, and that was them paperwork done, briefed, trained, everything walking on the job by Monday. Love it, man. That reminds yeah. me, we started, you know, we were, we were heavy into personal development and we've always said that we're a, we're an insurance agency uh, or Dis, what, we, what did you say that time? It's a leadership it's development a, company disguised as an insurance. Yeah, yeah. So we, we do life insurance for first responders nationwide. And um, Tyler actually put together a program where he would meet with the agents that wanted to and do um, life goals. So they would have just 90 day goals, simple things in their relationships. So some things he would do is be like, did you date your wife this week? And they would put goals together like that. Got to take your wife right? on a date. Got to take her every every week, and they would set a they would set you know a a a night that they were going to do it every night, and it's non negotiable, you know. And and did you have a high low conversation with your with each of your kids every day this week? So not just how was your day, but you know. And so those were some of the the goals, like in the relationships, they would do that for intellect and and development or personal development. They would do that for business, and and it could be personal, not it had anything to do with what they were doing for us. Um, and then they would do that in their health, because if you don't have your health, you got nothing. And so we, we started doing that and Tyler put this program together and we tracked and we didn't do it for this reason, but we just wanted people to be happier because I started looking at, at some of the people that I had taught to make a half a million dollars a year, $600,000 a year that were, making, that were working at Walmart before. You know what I'm saying? And it's not bad to work at Walmart. You do what you got to do, but that's a different lifestyle. And, and they were destroying their life. They were unhappy. And I was like, God, this is no fun. I want people around me that make a lot of money and destroy their marriage and their kids hate them and they're alcoholics and everything else. And so Tyler put that program together and, and started doing that. And we tracked, we tracked the people that wanted to do that and opt in. And we overlaid it from the time period before with the same people and them against their peers, their production went up by 27% and they were happy. And, and Tyler had a different project to work on, so I took over that. And I was kind of a little bit, I was a little nervous about it because people, I didn't know if people would want to share with the CEO of the company, you know what I'm saying? But I, but I really love doing them. And, and, and similar to your story you just told about that guy, I called one of the, one of the guys had his appointment with me and I called him up and, and he was sitting in his car and had his, sweat clothes on and I was like and as soon as I saw his face I was like bro what's going on like and he goes I'm sitting outside this gym and I'm gonna kill myself and I was like and the way he said it he wasn't kidding yeah. he was not kidding this wasn't a cry for help he's not one of those dudes he's a manly dude and I was like well let's scratch life goals for today you and I are just gonna talk and so we started talking and I shared my story and how I had been in the exact same position at times and 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 he was sharing why he was feeling that way and and as we talked through that all all I had him do was start telling himself how much he loved himself I called him the next day and he said I did it this morning I looked in the mirror just like you told me I did it after I got out of the shower and I was standing there buck naked and I told myself I love myself and and the crazy thing about it was over the next few weeks he got his marriage got on track everything got on track and he started appreciating himself and everybody around him it wasn't so much conflict and uh, and and it was a fascinating fascinating deal but that's when you look at a corporation that stuff doesn't happen in corporate America that doesn't happen and and like you said all the guy needed was a hug all this guy needed was to know he was loved and I made sure he knew that and and but it's a fascinating deal to be able to have that impact on somebody's life and now he's like he's an all-star he's an all-star